All right, so we all set? Yes. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Bogard. You can find me on Twitter at, at @jbogard. Um, this presentation, uh, as well as the code examples, are on my GitHub. I'll be uh, shooting out the links to the specific repositories and stuff on my Twitter. Um, and I've blogged about this topic and a lot of other things on my blog at jimmybogard.com. Uh, my day job is consulting, so I typically are building applications and systems for clients that uh, for some reason want to pay me to do that sort of thing. Um, and I did a lot of open source stuff. Uh, AutoMap or Mediator are two of my big projects, um, so either I'm sorry or you're welcome, one of those two things. <laughs> and this talk in particular came from uh, one of our clients that was uh, going from a monolithic application that was all deployed on-prem moving towards a microservice-oriented architecture deployed with Kubernetes and in Azure. So like throwing every single technology at the wall and seeing which one sticks, that sort of thing. And uh, my team in particular was charged with not only building some of these microservices, but at some point we had to figure out how to secure them. So this talk is the story of how we designed the security of those different services talking to each other and how we, were, uh, how we then use Azure, uh, Azure security features to be able to do so. But their existing system uh, was uh, built in a much simpler time. Um, and there was just a, it was a single monolithic application that was just a client server application. So they had a big ASP.NET web forms thing that uh, sat on servers on their, uh, on their data center. And then the clients were just browsers and some mobile apps uh, talking to these servers. Um, and so for them, it was pretty simple. Like we just have you know, the internet with, of, of things we don't trust. And then we have our server of the things that we do trust. And they would just use cookie-based authentication and authorization uh, to secure those servers. So you would log in, and in that cookie, you had some information about you. Um, I think they, they probably shoved way too much stuff in that cookie because like, the cookie was too big. Um, but in any case, uh, it was a very kind of straightforward set of security um, with this cookie-based authentication and authorization. Now, as they moved towards microservices where they simplified things, right? Um, it, became, it became a lot more complex and to understand how we should secure each of these different connections between each of these different systems and services. Um, so the new application they were building uh, was no longer gonna be a server-side rendered web application, you know, like MVC or anything like that. It is, of course, going to be a SPA. And SPAs by themselves already are going to have more complicated security requirements that may not be completely obvious to really anybody, I think, that, uh, that is looking at them for the first time. So um, their uh, architecture looks something like this in the Azure space. We had the clients, which is still gonna be a browser. Um, this is an Angular application that was talking to a single API endpoint, and this was using the BFF or backend for frontend uh, pattern. And so that API was purpose-built for uh, those individual clients. Now, those BFF APIs did not have any state by themselves. Their job in life was to aggregate backend data into coherent responses for the front end. Um, there's, different, there's different ways you can do those APIs, like BFFs, BFFs are, are ones that are very specific to the application calling them. Um, but you could also have API gateways, which are more generic, so you have different applications calling into this one API. Um, or you can use technologies like GraphQL um, that can be that, that API that is for your, uh, for your browser. Um, so the complicated thing here is uh, we, could, we could figure out the, the authentication and authorization between the client and that BFF. And it even could be very similar to our server-side web applications. Uh, what wasn't so clear was what do we do about all these, uh, all these other things behind the scenes? <clears throat> Um, so the first thing they had to figure out was how do we authenticate and authorize external users? So the people uh, using the browser, um, how can we authenticate? How do we know who you are and, and what kind of things you can do? Um, their existing application used that cookie-based authentication, uh, but it was all completely baked into that system and we couldn't make it portable to something else. Uh, and so uh, they wound up going um, with Auth0, an external identity provider, for those, uh, those, the authentication of those users. Okay, but this talk is not about Auth0, it's about Azure. Um, and so we still had to figure out, uh, what do we do behind the scenes here? So someone, uh, I don't know, I think an Auth0 service sales rep, like, uh, you know, went on a golf course and convinced them to, to buy Auth0, because uh, it's, it's, it's quite expensive to use, um, but it can help solve a lot of those, like, you know, single sign-on sort of problems. So he said, okay, that's great. Uh, 
Auth0, it'll take a few years for that to roll out, so we can't necessarily even count on it for our backend service communication. Um, so we need to figure out how do we secure all the things behind the scenes here. How do we secure, once I get past that first initial API call, how do I then secure the communication of uh, all these different microservices behind the scenes? And then we also have the added complication of on-prem servers also needing to call into our microservices for those kind of legacy systems, the legacy applications that were still out there. So our two big questions we had to answer was, one, how should we approach securing internal Azure communication? So when I have once something deployed in Azure, calling something else deployed in Azure, how do we secure that communication? And the answer is probably not nothing. Like probably, probably do some kind of authentication and authorization. Probably don't just leave it open to anyone to be able to call. Uh, and the second thing we're looking at was how do we, uh, how do we secure on-prem applications calling into our microservices? Now, I'm not a networking person, uh, so I'm not gonna talk about that at all because I will screw it all up. We, did, we also had very smart networking people that knew how to do the networky stuff, uh, like, I don't know, subnets and vnets and VPNs, all that sort of junk. I don't know any of that stuff, so like, just assume that that was all like, there and figured out, but not by me. Um, what we needed to do was, okay, let's say we can, we can still have these two systems sec you know, secured behind the scenes and not open to the public, well, I still don't want to necessarily just open up those APIs to be, be called by anybody. This client in particular uh, was dealing with personal information and health data. And so we had to be very, very careful about who we were going to be giving out that data to, especially in the States. I'm sure it's the same as here, here as well. Um, there's a lot of privacy laws and data protection laws that we had to adhere to. And it wasn't good enough for us to say, well, we got it secured to the front over there. Like the, the back and for front end does the security and then behind the scenes is just, you know, Wild West, anyone can call anything. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could still uh, properly lock down those APIs so not anyone that was just on the network could call these APIs and get access to that personal health information. <clears throat> so one of the ideas uh, um, that uh, our security team uh, really like latched onto and wanted to implement as part of this was known as the zero trust model, um, which is this idea of, of uh, not just assuming because you, you made it past this certain points that that's good enough, I don't have to do any further authentication or authorization. Um, instead with this idea of uh, zero trust model is that I don't, ever, I don't just trust any call that's made into me, that I always want to verify those individual calls. Now this is something that, like, again, if you're a security consultant, you're probably making bank off of this kind of concept because it's very like, vague and nebulous and it's hard to understand, like, well, what does it actually mean in practice to do this kind of thing? Um, so we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll do that. Okay, we'll do this zero trust thing, but then what does that actually mean in practice to always verify each individual step along the way? One possible way of doing this would be to say, well, we've already got this token for the front end user. They've already authenticated and have this, uh, this token that can expire and uh, can't be uh, spoofed and things like that. So why don't we just, quote, um, just flow that user token down into the backend microservices so that I don't have to come up with some other new authentication method uh, behind the scenes. Instead, I can just use what they've already got, like just use this token and then pass along to the next one down the line. Uh, the problem with that, well, there's two, two main problems. Uh, one. Um, because I'm using the same token in my microservice that is being used by the front end, that could mean that a front end caller, an Angular client, could call directly into my back end microservices. And that's not something we wanted to allow. Like even though the, you know, like maybe we, we made sure the networking pieces that it wouldn't be possible, um, but we didn't want to just say, you know, if you have a token, you can call our APIs, uh, because we didn't, want, we didn't want to allow the external clients to in any way, uh, shape, or form, be able to call into our backend microservices. The other problem we were running into were these on-prem systems uh, didn't have a token. Like their existing, uh, existing um, monolith that was using cookie-based authentication and authorization, they didn't have a token. So we would have to somehow like, okay, let's, let's make a token based on this cookie, and now I get a token to be able to call into you and everything's good. Um, so that was, like, that was gonna be way too complicated as well to try to deal with like, all these different possible callers, uh, these different possible uh, scenarios, um, because even though I just got like, you know, three on-prem things, there were actually like, I don't know, five or six different distinct authentication and identity providers because of acquisitions over the years. 
So given all that, like the, uh, the security team said, okay, yes, um, to help simplify things, uh, because we know that you're deployed inside of Azure, um, we can use Azure's security model to, to authenticate and authorize those inter-service communication calls. And so the various on-prem systems and external clients would still use their own identity providers to be able to authenticate the users. But then once we were inside the walled garden of Azure, and we were you know, basically just completely uh, cut off, we've cut off the communication from external users, in that case, we can use Azure's security model and for a number of reasons, which, which we'll see uh, shortly. <clears throat> so, uh, yes, um, we uh, said, great, uh, let's do Azure AD. Um, zero trust, Azure D, great. And that was given, this design was given to my team. And I said, okay, then uh, security team, how do we implement this? And then I heard like the rapid scurrying of feet as they ran out the door because they just drew a picture of us. It's like, yeah, just use this model. And it came time to my team, like, okay, how do we use this model? Um, this was a more conceptual idea from them and our team had to actually implement it. <clears throat> so um, the first thing we had to figure out was, well, if I have service A, wanting to call service B, and service B needs to have a, uh, I wanna have some kind of token that says this is, calling, uh, this is calling from service A, and I know it's this identity of service A, uh, we need to figure out how to first authenticate that service A to begin with. <clears throat> now Azure AD uh, supports a variety of authentication flows, and the ones that we were looking at in particular were OAuth 2.0 flows. And I am not an OAuth expert. There, <laughs> there are a lot of people much smarter than me about this, but me and my team, we had to implement this, so we had to look at this and try to figure out, okay, well, uh, what, what is the right way for us to even acquire a token? Like OAuth 1.0 has some pretty simple ways of doing so. OAuth 2.0, its authentication flow has become a bit more complicated. Now, one thing that's a little bit different with Azure AD with some other identity providers, and this client also was using Identity Server, now Duende, um, those can support like, really uh, any kind of authentication flow you want. What Azure AD tries to do though is try to guide you down the correct paths for these different kinds of authentication flows. So for some of these authentication flows, they won't allow certain ways of calling into it to say, well, you shouldn't be using this flow in this kind of scenario, so we're just gonna not allow it at all. So um, their docs uh, describe here are the different kinds of flows you can have or, base, or these different scenarios, and here's the OAuth flow you should use and then uh, who are the kinds of audiences that can acquire these kinds of tokens? So we looked at this picture, and we're like, okay, there's nothing that's like BFF microservice scenario, but we did see at the bottom here, well, here's, some two, here's two things that, that looks pretty similar to what we're trying to do, which is I have a web API that calls other web APIs. That's our back and for front end API. It is the thing that the Angular app is calling. Angular app calls the BFF API, and then that API is then calling our microservice API, so that looks like it's the right one. Uh, we also have situations where um, we don't have any user context, and, uh, or at least a user context that we can use to acquire a token, and so for that, it was a daemon app that calls web APIs. And so you can kind of think of this like, well, what if you've got a background service, a messaging endpoint, or something like that where there's no direct user interaction, so there's not a, a user logging in to do anything. Um, and so for that one, I don't have like a username password I can use. Instead, we can use the client credentials flow uh, to do so. Um, now, looking at the web API that calls web APIs, uh, we, could, we could use what's known as the on behalf of flow. And the idea here is that when I call a first API, that API is going to call out to my OAuth provider, my OAuth server, to acquire a machine token on behalf of this user token. So that way, when I get to my backend APIs, they're not, they're not passing through the user token, because I don't want to expose my backend APIs directly to the outside world. Instead, they're passing through this machine token that was acquired on behalf of the original token that was provided. Now, this works great if I'm in this audience of work or school accounts, that fun thing from Microsoft Identity that's like, <laughs> you know, like when you use live.com versus Microsoft.com authentication, I don't know why those are still different, uh, but those are the work or school accounts. Uh, or if you're in live.com, that's your personal account. Uh, and that, that's who the original audience of the token can be. But that's not us. 
we're not in Azure AD world and user land. In user land, we were like homegrown authentic authentication provider that was probably like you know, Microsoft identity from ASP.NET Web Forms days. Uh, and so that just had a cookie, so I didn't have, an, I don't even have a token to begin with. Um, and in the front end side, this, this new Angular application uh, was using initially identity server and was moving, moving to uh, Auth0. Um, so those are two completely different identity providers, neither of which are Microsoft. So he said, great, although we're like supposed to use the on behalf of flow, that's out because we can't acquire a token on behalf of like a token that's not Microsoft. So that left us at the very end um, with just the client credentials flow. And last time I gave this talk, someone came up to the end and was like, so the moral of the story is just use client credentials? I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but um, again, that's easier said than done because uh, these OAuth uh, credential flows really only talk about authentication. It does not describe authorization. That is, who, are, in, in these different flows, how do I make sure that I don't let anyone with a token, even if it's a valid, uh, uh, valid uh, Microsoft-based Azure AD token, I don't want any application to be able to just call into my, my APIs because we are dealing with this, um, this, this legally protected information, health data, personal data, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so um, our next uh, thing we needed to figure out was how do we then authorize these different applications to be able to call our APIs? So how do we make sure that only the right apps are the ones that uh, can do so? And this is one that uh, OWASP 2.0 doesn't have any recommendation for. Like It's completely up to your application how you decide to authorize individual apps calling other apps. And so all the different identity providers really have like their own like made up way of doing so. So if you go look at Auth0, it supports client credentials flow. If you wanna do authorization to say like only this API can call that API and not just anyone with a token from this issuer, uh, they have their own like made up way of doing so. Um, a lot of people use claims, so like I, uh, I say I want to call this other API and then I'm issued a set of claims. Uh, but again, that's something that you just have to completely make up yourself. You have to design that for, uh, what, for what you want to do. Or, um, for Microsoft Docs, they, they, have like, they have two main ways you can do this. Uh, the first one they had was an access control list. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You have, a, you have these ACLs that you define like who who are, the, uh, who are the appropriate apps that can call into me? Um, but they don't, have any necessarily, they don't have any support of actually configuring this inside of Azure. It's like, no, 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 when you do ACL, it is now 100% your client code and API code that has to say who, are, who is calling me and are, are they the right person? <clears throat> so for simple systems, this, this can work. If I say like, I know that these are my three callers that are allowed to call me, I can just look at the token and say, well, you're one of these three people. And then somewhere in my application, um, in my configuration, I have the list of these are the three people that can call me and no one else. But it's just like 100% custom logic about what you actually do there. Something that um, Microsoft supports though is this idea of application permissions. And uh, when we go the application permission route, then we are actually configuring uh, the secured resources inside of Azure to be able to do so. So if I'm on the left, it's 100% custom code in my application. And in the right, it is configuration inside of Azure AD to uh, build this out. So um, these application permissions, uh, we can define custom, they're called roles, whatever, but they are, they are permissions. And then we assign those roles to specific principles. Um, and then when I acquire a token for, for service A calling service B, service A will ask uh, Azure AD to say, hello, I am service A, I want to call service B. Azure AD looks up and says, who, uh, well, based on service A, which roles or permissions have you, are, do you have assigned to service B? And then the token that comes back will then contain the roles assigned to service A for service B. And in this way, instead of having like these kind of generic um, claims that don't necessarily do, like, are tied to individual callers, instead what we can have is very specific uh, uh, role assignments to say, um, uh, service A, you can call these different kinds of things, but service C, 
Um, you're not allowed to have that much access to data because you're going to be using this purpose, so you only have these specific role permissions assigned to you. And then on the server side, when it receives that request, um, the server will then actually do the code to authorize the individual roles. <clears throat> now, in terms of like which one of these kinds of ways of doing things is better, it is really specific to uh, you know, your domain and your application. Um, that's not like one is necessarily better than the other. There's going to be trade-offs to each of these approaches. For us, though, we knew that uh, because we are, had protected health data, um, that we knew that some APIs that we built would have more... <laughs> I guess, more protected data than others. So if you are calling an API that doesn't have that protected data, we let more people in to be able to call that. But if you were wanting to get that protected health information and personal information, they said, well, we don't want to let anyone be able to call us. We're going to authorize these specific applications to be able to call us because we knew that those applications could then do the extra kind of business logic to hide specific data based on lots of crazy business rules. So for us, that's what we, we thought, okay, let's do these permissions because then that lets us have much more granular control about who, which specific applications are authorized to call my APIs. So based on that picture, we built out a greatly simplified application. And we could, we could get it down to basically just this kind of, these, these kinds of clients and these kinds of servers. So in this much simplified scenario, we, we got rid of all like the Kubernetes stuff because I don't want to deal with that stuff anyway. And we had this, this greatly simplified picture where we have the two different kinds of clients. One is a client deployed inside of Azure, and then we have another client deployed outside of Azure. And for me, outside of Azure is just going to be this laptop here. And then uh, our server will also be deployed inside of Azure as well. The server and the Azure client are just going to be Azure App Services, to make my life a bit simpler. And then the external client is just going to be a console app on my laptop. All right. Um, so we said, great, let's do this uh, role-based role auth with these permissions. Um, and so the next thing we needed to do was to define what those permissions should be. And this is a design decision that we had to make as the people well, defining the system. How granular or coarse-grained should these roles be? Um, and again, even though they're called roles inside of Azure, um, in practice, we define them more as like permissions to perform a specific kind of activity. And the built-in roles inside Azure AD as well uh, map to that as well. <clears throat> so this API uh, that, we, that we're going to have for our demo um, is just a to-do API. So I can uh, get all the to-do items. I can get a single to-do item. I can update a to-do item, I can create a to-do item, or I can delete a to-do item. And I chose this example because I could find the code for it on the internet, and I can use it and not have to come up with something myself. I'm just that lazy. OK, so uh, based on this, um, we need to figure out, well, what, what kind of uh, permissions should we define for each of these different API endpoints? We could define a distinct permission per individual thing you're trying to do. So I can have like a read, like your CRUD, right? Read, update, create, delete. And if I have other kinds of operations as part of these things, so if you needed to like, I don't know, approve a to-do item, I could have like to-do.approve because that's a specific permission. Um, so it did, we did have to go back and understand, well, what are the different kinds of callers I'm going to have in my applications? Uh, and what is the kind of the shape or surface area of those different kinds of things they should be called? The more permissions I create, like the more control I have, but then the more overhead I will have to maintain these to say like, well, if I want to do these six things, I got to go grant you permission for those six things. So uh, the other way to do it is be a little bit more coarse grained. Um, and so we can do something like just read and write to say I have some, set, some sets of applications that can read and write data, and they have other sets of applications that are only allowed to read data. We don't want to allow them to write that data. Um, and so for our, like, our actual real system, this is more the path we went through is just looking at, okay, there's, uh, there's like read, there's write, and there's also like read protected, like read protected data or read um, health data. Um, and so we, we basically shaped and defined those permissions based on the business use cases that we, were, uh, that we saw in our system. Uh, we can change these as well. We, don't, we can add new permissions we need to, we need to uh, like, go to a different role or make it more granular, that's all possible as well. All right, enough talk, let's go look at a demo.
All right, now I am doing the scary thing of doing an Azure cloud-based talk on conference Wi-Fi, so let's all cross our fingers to see how well this is going to work. But it was working just a few minutes ago, so hopefully it'll all be okay. All right. All right, is this big enough for the folks in the back? All right, I can't see anything, so I guess it's okay. All right, so this is my simplified application system here. I've got my Azure client, that is an ASP.NET 6 app that is deployed out into Azure. I have my Azure server, which is also an ASP.NET 6 app, web app deployed into Azure. And then I have my external client, which is just a console application, which is only gonna be running on my laptop here. And the final thing I have here is in my, this infrastructure project, um, it can be very complicated to understand how things relate to each other inside of Azure. So I, I, when I first did this, I set up all these different things using the Azure portal. Um, but once you're done setting everything up, you kind of forget like, what are all the things I clicked to make this work? I forget. Um, and so for us, like my real team was using Terraform. I, I don't like that weird language. So I'm using uh, Pulumi because, hey, C Sharp. Um, but one of the nice things we can do with this is uh, as we're building out these resources, instead of me clicking around the portal, which can fail, I'll be showing here the resources in C Sharp code, which are just mapping them out to uh, Azure resources. This is not a talk about Pulumi. It's just way easier to conceptualize things when I'm looking at code versus click, 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 click inside the Azure portal. All right, so right now this API is not secured whatsoever. So if I go over to uh, program CS, we can see that it does not have any kind of like authentication, or it is authentication authorization, um, but does not define any kind of uh, means of doing so. Um, so I've, I've not yet told it how it should authenticate uh, to be able to do anything. And just to prove that these are actually in Azure, I've got, this is my client on the free tier, so please don't go hit this. It's, it's very slow. There we go. So I've got this actually deployed on an Azure, but for a lot of this, we'll be just running on my local laptop here. Okay, so uh, we'll go back over to our Pulumi infrastructure. And um, the way Pulumi works is uh, you, can, you can do this from the command line where you say, like, you install the client tools and you say Pulumi up. It will compile this application, and then based on the things I've defined on here, it will then create those resources out in Azure. I have already created all those resources, so uh, I won't actually be updating as we go. We'll look at more of the final product at the end, because I don't trust the speed of creating these resources. Sometimes it can take just a little bit of time. All right, so in my stack, this Pulumi stack, um, we created a, I created just a, uh, a few things from the, from the get-go to make my life a little bit easier. So the first thing I've created is a resource group that everything uh, is going to be under. Um, and then I'm also going to be creating some app services under this app service plan. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is, in our server, we're going to define the Azure resources uh, necessary for both deploying the application and also securing it. So let me go ahead and pull this over first. I was going to use a mouse, but this is sloped like this, and so the mouse just kept falling down. All right, so uh, first up, I've got my Azure web app. So this is an Azure app service I'm going to be deploying. Um, and so this is, the, you know, this is the, the actual deployed application inside of Azure. Um, the only kind of interesting thing we have here is like we're turning on HTTPS. I'm telling it what resource group, uh, where the location should be, which I think right now is still like central US, whatever. And uh, that when it runs, it should run .NET Azure Server .dll. All right, so that's just the running application. The next thing I'm going to need is going to be the Azure ID components. So for this, here. All right, so every, like identity provider that supports client credentials has different ways of defining these applications that I'm going to secure. So Auth0 has its own like definition of, of like what are the different applications and servers that could be secured. And Azure AD has its own way of defining these things as well. Because again, Auth0 defines a protocol. It doesn't define like how you should actually manage this behind the scenes. 
Like how do I actually manage what are the different applications, what can call each other? That is completely up to you and so, or completely up to the identity provider. So in this case, um, we are creating what's known as a uh, Azure AD application uh, called server application. <clears throat> and not a whole lot of uh, information here. I'm just giving it a display name and then some identifier URIs, which when, we come to, when it comes time to actually calling uh, and, and trying to acquire a token, that's where the identifier URI will become important. All right, so we said we needed to uh, uh, define some roles for this, uh, this application, and so I need to create that as part of this as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is pull over some definitions of some role IDs, um, and so what these are, uh, each role will have a, have a unique identifier, um, and I need to refer that to identifier in other places, so I'm using Plumi's uh, random UUID, um, to be able to define those IDs so they can e more easily uh, refer them to other places. And then the final thing is to modify my application definition to give it some app roles. So let me go and pull this over here. Okay, so I'm still modifying the server application and in Azure AD, this server application, this, this Azure AD to application object it's just a way for me to kind of group together uh, and define like this is some kind of secured resource that you want to uh, apply some logic to. It is not actually something, it's not something that's running somewhere. It's just a bunch of data about something that you want to secure. All right, so I've said, I want to define two app roles. One is todo.read and the other is todo.write. And so my todo.read, I tell it, these are the kinds of uh, assignments you, you are allowed to have. And so I have said that you can assign this role to users and you can assign this role to applications. Now, I don't technically need that first one, users, because these are applications calling other applications. However, when I'm testing this locally on my laptop, well, I am a user. And so I still wanna be able to call this API and have it still go through all the authorization. So we'll also allow those roles to be assigned to users as well. It's enabled, here's the display stuff, and then finally the ID of the role, I'm giving it the value here. If I don't give it an ID here, it'll just make something up, and then I'll have to copy and paste that uh, made up uh, ID all over the place. So here, I'm defining the ID so that I can, uh, I, it's deterministic, I know exactly what that ID is uh, for that. Do the same thing for write, to do dot write. At this point, when I, uh, when I configure this application, or configure this, uh, this resource, um, I will have this Azure AD uh, example server application defined inside of Azure AD. And now I need to then in my server actually authorize against this information here. So let's now go over to our actual server application. So over here, I've got that web API that we created and right now, it's not authenticating or authorizing against Azure AD. And in order to authorize against Azure AD, I could do things manually, right? I could go look at the JOT coming in, um, and then I can look at the audience, I can look at the issuer, and be like, okay, these all kind of line up. Uh, but to help simplify things, Microsoft has a library. So if I'm an API that wants to be secured with uh, Azure AD, I can pull in this Microsoft.identity.web package to make it much easier for my server API to authenticate and authorize against Azure AD. Not required, but makes my life quite a bit easier because as we'll see, back over here. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull this over now. I'll just stick this up top. Oop, it needs to be down here. <coughs> we are going to say, uh, builder.services.add Microsoft Identity Web, I, Web API authentication, passing it in our configuration. And so what that will do is for incoming requests, it will do the, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll look at the token, make sure that it's against the correct issuer, against the correct audience, and against the, uh, the, the, the right subject, um, all for me behind the scenes. And then all I have to do in my configuration is tell it, what I should authenticate, there we go. All right, so in this, I will tell it the 
Azure AD instance, and so I don't have like a, my own custom Azure AD login, so it's just gonna be the login at microsoftonline.com. And then these next things, tenant ID and client ID, um, this is what's defined then in Azure AD. So the tenant ID is gonna be the tenants of your Azure AD directory, and then, which is you know, basically a bucket of things you can secure, and then the client ID, this is what's gonna be the first confusing thing of Azure AD, and it definitely won't be the last, um, this is the unique identifier of this server application thing here. So this right here is uh, out pops, uh, out. <laughs> from this we'll uh, get a, a, a unique identifier. And if I go over to my Azure portal, all right, so over here under Azure Active Directory, there's an app registrations and this is the list of applications. They're also called, called app registrations because Microsoft likes to rename things every three years or so. Uh, so this, these app registrations are those applications that I've defined uh, in Azure AD. So I've got my server here. And uh, right here we can see this application parentheses client ID. And this is the unique identifier of this securable resource. Now this is not tied to my app service right now. Like my app service, when it runs, will raise its hand and say, hello, I am this client application ID. Um, and so whenever it authenticates and authorizes uh, those tokens, it is going to be doing so under the umbrella of being this application. Okay, so over here in my app settings JSON, we can see that the client ID is F12 something, and right here the application client ID is F12 something. So. Those line up. All right. Um, so this will uh, authenticate calls uh, being made in, but we wanted to add on top of this uh, some role-based authorization. So we're going to do that in our controllers. If I go to my to-do items controller, controller, we can see that it's already doing the authorize. So it will, you know, do the it'll do the thing to make sure the token looks good. Um, but we want to on each of our different controller actions authorize the appropriate role that we defined earlier, role being the uh, permission. So over here, this is a get, so the get's going to be the to-do.read. Yep. This is another get, so that's a to-do.read. This is put, so that's gonna be to-do.write. This is post, to-do.write. And then delete, oh. Wrong place. It's way easier with a mouse. To do that right. All right. <clears throat> so um, there's a few things that are going to happen behind the scenes for us. Um, so like my first encounter with role-based authorization was when I was doing cookie-based authorization, and it would look at like the, the roles assigned to that identity um, and look at that sort of thing. So this is still doing that for us underneath the cupboard. It is doing the, you know, look at my identity, uh, look at the roles on that identity. However, th those roles and your identity, when you're running, get populated from the token being passed in. So this part here, program CS, um, this is just some funky thing to, uh, <laughs> by default, uh, it will map some weird claims out to, uh, to my, 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 my token or my, my identity. Um, so the little extra piece of configuration here where I say the role claim type is roles, there's going to be a roles claim, we'll see here in a minute, in our token, um, just an array of values, and it will take those values and then put them in the, the role in my identity when it actually runs. So in my controller, you notice I'm not like, I'm not poking around tokens at all. I'm simply saying, authorize that you're in the, uh, that you have this specific role to do that right. All right. <clears throat> so, um, I have these, uh, have these roles defined, um, but if I run the application, Put it, push the turbo button so it runs faster. I just got Swagger UI running to help my local testing of this API. And so if I call one of these APIs, try it out, what's gonna happen? Oh, unauthorized. 
because I have not authorized or authenticated as me being running in this browser. So the next thing we needed to figure out was, okay, well, when I'm deployed to Azure, I know I can like, have these applications authorized permissions, but for me running locally, um, I still wanna be able to call these APIs. Um, I don't wanna turn security off locally, because then I, you know, I might be able to exercise those code paths. Um, so what we wound up doing was, was uh, we created additional Azure AD resources uh, with groups, and then we assigned like, my user to that group, and then assigned permissions to that group, so that when I, as me, Jimmy, uh, calling and wanting a token for that API, it will return back the roles based on my group that's been assigned. Application permissions can be assigned to users, groups of users, or other applications. And I'm the group of users. All right, so let's get that set up. <clears throat> All right, so back over in my server definition over here, I'm gonna be adding a couple other things here. Um, the first thing I'm going to be adding is a scope definition. So this uh, OAuth scope definition is just there because when I'm using this specific flow of calling from a browser, um, Azure AD only supports scopes uh, to be able to say, I want this. But we will get that scope, but we'll also get back our roles as well. But it can't just deal with only roles for reasons. So I have to create some made up scope that I'm using just to be able to call this API. The next piece is a bit big, so I'll, I'll just bring it over and talk through it. Yeah. All right. Um, again, this is, now, this is still in the, in the vein of like every single uh, kind of identity provider will do this slightly differently. Um, and so for this, I am, a, uh, I am the Swagger browser app wanting to get a token on behalf of me, Jimmy, um, for this API. Uh, and so uh, I have to, uh, this is not something that's open by default, I have to configure this application resource to allow this kind of flow. So I'm telling it, okay, you're going to have an API, um, because that's what Microsoft assumes in their Azure AD application definition, is that if you are wanting to support this kind of flow, then you must be an API, whatever. Um, but what this is really doing though is uh, enabling a specific kind of OAuth flow, um, the auth code flow. And so I'm going to say, okay, you have this uh, set of permission scopes. Um, the name of this, the, uh, this scope is called local dev for whatever reason. Um, and then here's the ID of that, uh, that local dev, um, the ID of the local dev scope ID. Yes, there we go. All right, um, the last piece I need to do is in order for me to uh, assign permissions to this application, we have to graduate our application into something that is uh, now securable inside of Azure AD. Um, in the portal, these are known as enterprise applications. Uh, I don't know why, but that's just the name of them. Um, some legacy reason, I'm sure. And so we have to graduate our API to something that can be now, uh, something that can have uh, permissions assigned to it. So a few things I pulled in here. Uh, first of all is the uh, defining a service principle. And the service principle, you can kind of think is like that root table that my roles have to join to, to be, have them assigned. Um, and so this service principle, um, I'm saying, uh, I'm giving it whatever name, and saying the application ID that this service principle is tied to is the server application. And so when I run this in Pulumi, that makes this little link show up where it says managed application and local directory. If I did not define this managed, app or this, uh, this, uh, managed application, um, it would not have that link and then I couldn't assign, uh, I couldn't assign roles to this server. Okay. The next thing uh, is a, a really wonky thing, um, which is when I, uh, when I, as the browser, wants to acquire a token, um, it wants to uh, define a specific audience about who is calling that API. And so there's a, there's a well-known client ID for Visual Studio. There's a well-known client ID for Visual Studio Code, a well-known client ID for the Azure CLI. So when I'm trying to acquire a token for something else, it will use that well-known, quote, uh, 
uh, ID to be able to do so. All right, so I'm saying I'm pre-authorizing this application with this, quote, well-known ID that is just baked into Visual Studio since like 2005 or something. And then I'm telling it to the application object ID that it's going to be authorizing. So this is the server application. And then finally, uh, what are the permission IDs that uh, I want to authorize you for? And so that permission ID is gonna be my local dev scope, that right there. All right, so that would allow me to run, when I F5 Visual Studio and make a call out to get a token, um, this will make sure that I, can, I have this, uh, those things connected. However, me as the user still don't have the appropriate permissions to do so. So while I may get a token, I might not have the right roles that come back in that token. So for that, I'm going to create some methods here. All right. So I, uh, I made a couple methods inside my Pulumi uh, configuration here. And what these methods are doing is just making it kind of easy for me to assign specific kinds of permissions. Uh, and so here I've got um, two methods, one to assign read and one to assign write. And in order to assign a permission to a thing, I need to know a few things. One is, what do you want to call the thing? So I've got like this prefix and the name of who I'm getting assigned to because they, they all have to have kind of distinct names inside of my configuration. Um, and then I need to know who am I assigning this permission to? Who is that principal that will receive this? And again, who can I assign permissions to or roles? Users, groups of users, or other applications. So I need to know what is the principal ID of that thing I'm trying to assign the role to so that it can basically create this, this, uh, this record here, or this resource here, which is an app role assignment. That is, I want to assign this role that belongs to this principal to this other thing. And when I've designed role-based uh, permissions and applications, there's some table somewhere, right, that is, here's the, uh, here's the, here's the list of principles, here's the list of roles, and there's a join there, and then somewhere is gonna be an assignment table of which permissions are assigned to which thing. And that's, that's basically what this is. It's creating a row in a table somewhere that says, uh, this role for this uh, resource is assigned to this other principle. That's what that is. So I, got, I have two methods, one for the todo.read, and then another one for the todo.write. And then I will define another method here, which is, assigning the role for the Azure AD resources. And the Azure AD resources is just my user and the local dev group that I've created earlier. Now, this is not something that's specific to my application, so some, probably like an admin or somewhere gets a support ticket that says, I need to create an Azure AD group, okay, great. And then you need to assign these people to that group, okay, great. Um, and so that's what this, is, this uh, set of resources are, is just I want to create a group that makes it easier to manage you know, who can get these local dev permissions. Um, and then I'm going to assign me to that group. This is probably not done via Pulumi in your organizations or IAC, it's probably done via like a service ticket, someone has to go in and actually do this. In any case, um, I want to assign the read and write role to the local dev group pr uh, service principal. Finally, over here on my stack, I need to actually call that method that I've created. So after I've created the server client and the external client resources, I'm going to assign the roles for the Azure AD resources. All right. The last thing, so once I run this, it will assign the local dev group to those, those permissions. And over here I can actually see that if I go click the application registration, the enterprise application, there's a users and groups. And we can see that my local dev group has been assigned the write and read role, which is really permission. All right, so um, that will ensure that uh, those groups are assigned, but I still have to tell Swagger how to uh, authorize. So back in my application here, I'm going to uh, modify the Swagger options to authorize uh, appropriately with Azure AD and OAuth2 auth code flow, 
And so that's this configuration here. I have to tell it the URL, what to authorize, the token URL. And what this will do is when I run this, it'll now introduce that little padlock in the Swagger UI so that I can authenticate inside my browser uh, against Azure AD. And the final thing down here is the modifying the UI to do its thing as well. And so I tell it, you know, you, you, there's your client ID, the scope separator space because reasons, and then also to use the PKCE way of doing auth code flow. Again, this is just for local development. Um, usually I would turn those off when I go to production because like Swagger's turned off altogether, um, but this is just for my local development. So now when I run, I get a nice little padlock eventually. Ah, authorize. I go click that, and down here, it's a little difficult to see, but it says, oh, let me bump it up, bip, bip, bip. Um, the scope that I'm going to define is local dev, because I'd have to make something up for this code to be, for this flow to uh, get all my claims back. So that's just kind of a made up scope. Uh, my client ID, of course, is F12, I think that's the Visual Studio one. And then I click, no, no, I'm sorry, that's the, server, I click authorize. If I was not logged in to Microsoft.com or live.com, whatever, you would get that like login screen, pick the account that you want to use, so you're this person, and then it comes back, and then I hit close. So now when I hit get, and I try this out, executes. Let's, oh, it actually succeeded this time, 200, so here's my two items, and let's grab this token, doot and go to jot.ms, token, and ta-da, there are my roles. Those show up because my user is uh, a member of that local dev group, and I've assigned those two roles, those permissions, to that local dev group. So when I ask for a token, it's gonna give me back all the claims that I have for that resource, and me as Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Bogard, I have this made up scope of local dev, which I don't care about, but I also get back my roles. So when I call that API, I've got those roles and it will authorize those roles against those different API endpoints and I can actually do local dev, huzzah. All right. So at that point, my server is secured. Like it's, it's good to go, I can deploy that out and I now can, uh, you know, I can now do role based authorization against any kind of client. The next thing I want to do is then uh, define the authorization components for those two clients, the, the external client as well as the Azure client. Now the external client, uh, again, is just a console application here. Um, because I'm going to use client credentials flow, there are a few different options for my client to obtain those credentials. Uh, one is with a client ID and secrets that can be rotated, so I can say like, it's got some secrets, um, and then you know, if I want to expire that secret, I can create a new one and then expire the old one, or you can use certificates. In my actual systems, we were using certificates, but that's such a pain to create and set up that I didn't want to do that. Um, so instead, I'm just using uh, client ID and client secrets. All right, so in our client application, our external client, I'm going to first bring over the application definition this is now the application definition of the client. Now it's kind of funny because like, I'm defining these Azure AD resources, but this client is not running in Azure. But it's just using Azure AD as that token provider and the identity provider. So when it wants to acquire a token, like I am resource A, wanting to acquire a token for resource B, um, it's just calling out to Azure to do so. So these are the, the Azure AD components to get, put all that together. So I first need to create an application, but this time, this is the external client application. I also define an application secret. So I've got an application password for the secret that I'm going to not show you, but I put into user secrets in Visual Studio. And when I'm running in Azure, then I've probably got some configuration up there to uh, store the secrets. No, I'm not running in Azure. Um, you would <laughs> store it in some secure way. Uh, in order to assign different roles to different things, I need to have a principal associated with this. Um, if I don't want to assign roles to things, I don't need a principal, but I do want to assign roles for this client application, so I need that. And then for the external client, I need to configure some things as well. Uh, client ID, there we go. 
So I'm gonna pull in some configuration for the external client. And this external client, lots of stuff here. Um, it's gonna be making API calls out to the, the Azure server. But when it does so, I wanna make sure that it is able to acquire a token appropriately. And so I'm bringing in, let's see, what is this library? It is the Microsoft Identity Client. So if I am a client wanting to acquire token of, uh, from Azure AD, I can use that library to do so. <clears throat> um, I am using typed HTTP clients with some middleware, and that middleware is going to include uh, an ability to acquire a token. So this middleware, this client authentic application auth handler, will, before it makes a call out, will call acquire token from client. This is from the Microsoft Identity Client Library. It'll acquire a token uh, based on the application ID that I want to call, and it will uh, get basically all of the all of the different uh, claims for that application ID. <clears throat> then it will get the result of that, put it in a bearer token, so that when I actually call the API, uh, it's, it's putting that bearer token on the authorization headers as it goes out the door. So now my client application, my external clients, will be able to call Azure AD to get a token to then call out to uh, my server. However, uh, we're still like, like quite there yet, we still need to assign those roles for that client to the server. So back over in my server, I'm going to add another overload for assign roles, which is this. And for this external client, I trust it less, and so I'm only going to be assigning the read permission, not the read and write. Finally, in my stack, I will go ahead and assign those specific roles all right, so now let's run the server. And run the client, the external client, that is. And we're trying to run the external client. Debug. Uh -huh. And to make my life a little easier, I'm just going to log the token out. Don't do this in production, don't, don't shove your token in the log, probably a bad idea. But it'll make my life a little bit easier because now I can take that, go back over to my browser, go to jot.ms, and now we see the token that my external client got only includes the todo.read, and it used client ID, client secrets to acquire that token, and so the, the, the server um, the client, the external client said, I am this external client, I want to get tokens for that server over there, and it's only going to return back the roles that have been assigned to it. All right, the last piece of the puzzle is our Azure client. Now something that's different in Azure land versus running externally is this Azure has this concept of managed identities. And one of the things I can do is have my application run as a managed identity so that I don't have to use client ID secrets or certificates I can set assign roles to that managed identity, and then that managed identity will then be the thing that my application runs like as. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to go back over to my client. This is now the Azure client. And I'm gonna pull these pieces over here. I'm going to have, there it is. Um, again, this is running inside of Azure, so I'm going to be defining an Azure App Service web app. That's this piece here. And then I'll also be uh, giving it a user assigned identity. So this is, oops, this is a custom thing. Uh, it always runs under some identity, but I'm going to give it a user assigned identity. And I need to modify my app service definition to say you need to run with this identity. So I'm saying you're going to be running under a managed service identity that is this user assigned identity that I have right here. Finally, let's go ahead and output these out. So I'm just capturing those variables so I can refer to them in other places. I need to go now to my server and assign those roles. So I'm gonna create another overload of assigned roles, which is 
to assign the client that internal Azure client will get both the read and write roles. And then finally, over in my Pulumi stack, I will say server to assign roles, prefix, and then the client as well. So my local dev group gets read and write, the external client only gets read, and the internal Azure client that runs in Azure will only get, uh, will only get, the, will get read and write. Now, uh, my Azure client, I have to do something else to make it be able to authenticate and authorize. So the first thing I'm going to do is get some configuration in here. This is the last piece we're doing. Okay, so this client ID is now the client ID of the application. Um, actually, no, it's the ID of the managed identity because that's who the, this client will be running as in Azure. And then over in my startup, where I've got this configure services stuff, I've got that to pull in. So I, uh, in my Azure client, if I'm an Azure client inside of Azure talking to other Azure services, we can actually now use the Azure.identity package. You may have seen this if using managed identities to talk to Key Vault or Azure SQL, things like that. We can also use the Azure Identity uh, library if I'm an Azure application to calling other Azure applications, I can use this as well. So back in my startup, oops, startup, I've got, uh -huh, oops, wrong place. Um, I'm doing some similar configurations. So what my, uh, this Azure client is doing, it's a dumb API. It is an API that just calls the other API through a type HP client. This one is not secured. So it's just internally using the managed identity to acquire the token to call the other API. So it's just completely open to the internet here. Okay, so now uh, when I run this inside of Azure, I've got this up and going. This is my Azure client that's running under a managed identity. And now when I make the call to the server, it was successful. So it successfully acquired that token. And now I'm gonna go over and grab in my app services, the client. We'll go look at the logs, and I can pull the jot out of there. Log stream. Where's my log stream? Down. There we go. All right, we'll make that request again. Ah, where's that? Where's my token? There we go. So we grab this token. Pop it in my JOT decoder. And sure enough, I see that for this application, running under this managed identity, is be able to assign, uh, get these different roles assigned to it uh, when it acquired that token. And then my code itself was completely transparent. So if I look at my application code, in my controller, I just have this typed HTTP client, but underneath the covers, it is going to be using Azure identity to acquire that token. So down here, it says, uh, uh, Credential.get token async, it gets the token for me, and then all is well and good in the world. So that was securing microservices uh, using Azure AD. Um, I know like the, the basically the moral of the story was just use client credentials. Um, what was interesting about Azure though is that because Azure has this concept of managed identities, then all of my Azure clients, I don't have to manage certificates or secrets. It is completely transparent to me and I don't have to worry about doing the assignments. For external clients though, because they're not running in like Azure land, then it will revert back, revert back to either certificates or client secrets to be able to acquire those tokens. So thank you all very much. If you wanna see the running example of this and pull it down locally, you can uh, pull down this, uh, this repository at the bottom, the Azure AD example. Um, you can run that against your <laughs> Azure uh, um, uh, to, uh, credits and stuff instead of mine uh, to be able to get it uh, all running locally. So thank you very much. I hope you all have a great rest of the conference. I'll be sticking around for a little bit for questions. Otherwise, uh, thanks. And please do, uh, don't forget to drop the cards in there. Um, I do uh, throw out all the reds if you drop any in there, so just. <laughs>